Welcome to another episode of the Dan Lok Show. Today, I am super excited. We're going to talk about money and building wealth. Now, today, I have a very special guest. It's someone that I've actually studied a long time ago in the beginning of my career. I actually read the book called The Automatic Millionaire. Now, you may have seen that book. You may have read that book. It's, it's one of those books in the beginning when I was just getting going in my career and I was making a little bit of money, but I had no clue how to manage the money. So super excited to be joined by the nine-time, nine-time best-selling author, co-founder of AE Wealth Management and co-founder and also founder of Finish Rich Media. He's impact millions of people's lives, including myself, through his keynotes, through his speeches, through his books, obviously, and also his newsletter. One of the most trusted advisors in today's modern world. David, welcome to the show. Dan, thank you very much. And, and I'll, I, you know, first of all, I appreciate the introduction. And I'll also just share with you some really cool news that this little book here, The Latte Factor, just became the 10th New York Times bestselling book that we've done. So yeah, That's right. So the new and, book. And you're in Canada. It's an international bestseller. It's on the Canadian bestseller list right now. So wow. thanks to all my Canadian friends. You guys have been buying this book and by the droves. And it's exciting. We just sold our 10th language here in like the last two weeks. So we're starting to get translated all over the world. And um, we've gone back to print six times. We sold out. You know how hard this is because you've got a book. We yes. actually, Amazon sold out a week ago. Wow. And we had to rush a whole bunch more books to them. So um, the message is getting around the world. I appreciate being with you and your amazing followership because, you know, we were just talking before we went live. Mm. You've exploded all over the world, <laughs> your media platform. So congratulations to you for your success. Thank you. Thank you. And David, I always want to get into a little bit of story, right? Talk to us how you got into like writing about building wealth and, and writing about money and, and finance. How did this all start? I'll tell you this story. Sometimes stories, they're almost hard to believe because this one, this is a pretty amazing story. Um, back in 1994, mm. I decided to teach a class on women and money. In, in Lafayette, California, that's where I'm from, is the Bay Area. Mm. And the reason I decided to teach that class was I was a financial advisor working at a company called Dean Witter, which just became, which is now Morgan Stanley. Mm. And I had a bunch of, well, bunch, we had three clients pass away in 30 days. Wow. And I met with three widows. They were all widows, by the way, important point here. They were all widows. It was all men that passed away, which is typical because men die usually first. Yes. The average age of widowhood today in the U.S., is 57. Mm. Let me just like hear that one for a moment, ladies. The average age of widowhood is 57 and 80% of men die married and 80% of women die widowed. Wow. So as I sat in on these meetings, I realized as a financial advisor that I really had a need to get my women clients up to speed on, on their financial knowledge. Mm. And, and I had been raised by a woman, my grandma Rose Bach, who was like the matriarch, who had, who had basically been in charge of the family finances, but she was not the norm. I was seeing all these women that had delegated it to their husbands. Yes. So, I, so I created this class, Dan. I didn't know if anybody would come, right? Like probably the first time you did something. You don't know if people are going to show up. Yes. And I rented a hotel room, right? Put my own money out to rent the hotel room. Wow. I was totally nervous. I went to the local newspaper to run an ad. They wouldn't even return my phone calls. I was so <laughs> mad at them that they wouldn't, get, they wouldn't return my phone calls. I went down to the editor and said, your salespeople won't return my phone call. Um, I'm teaching this class. Would you, how about you bring a local reporter down? Mm. Which she did. And the local newspaper wrote a feature story about this young kid teaching class for women and money. And I got asked at that first class, 1994, what's a good book for women and money? Mm. And, and, and there wasn't one. Mm. But I didn't know that at the time. Like literally, I, I said, you know, I don't know, but let me go to the library back in the old days before the internet. Yes. Let me before, see before, you... before Amazon, yeah, right? Exactly. You're doing the thing too. You know what that is, right? That's yeah. the, those little cards that you would go through the library. Yes. And I went to the library and there was a book from 1970 for women and money. Wow. And I went, wow, that's crazy. Because like women buy like 80% of all books. How can there not be a book for women and money? Yes. So the thing that's amazing about this story is that Four weeks ago, I launched my book tour with my family. My family today manages $1.1 billion for mm. clients. Mm. And we had a very small group of our top clients, like 200 clients there. And there were two women that have been clients now for 25 years. Wow. That were at that first seminar in 1994. Wow. And one of those women 
who was in that first seminar, ultimately she went on Oprah Winfrey with me. She was an example of an automatic millionaire and she was there when I launched the automatic millionaire book and that was back in 2004. So wow. life has come full circle. We, That's I, had circle. A, we, I had a mission to take, my, you know, you always have to have missions. Like I know a lot of entrepreneurs watch your show. Yes. And I have always been mission focused. Yes. So when I wrote the book, it wasn't to write a book. I always tell people, don't write books to write books. Write books to change the world. Yes. So, so yes. I wanted to write a book that would help 1 million women take charge of their financial life so they could protect themselves mm. and teach their kids mm. and protect their families. That became my overarching driving mission. And then I just started going, well, how could we teach a million people in less than 10 years? Mm. And by doing that, that's what led to my really my next career. Cause I was at Morgan Stanley At the time you had to have a million dollars in order to hire me to be your financial advisor. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to work with people. I wanted to help people who didn't have a million dollars, right? Like 99% of the world doesn't have a million dollars. So Correct. I wanted to go help those people. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to do what I do. And now 13 books later, you know, I'm still doing it. I never did it for the money. I always did it for the mission. What yes. happens when your mission is clear, it's a good line for people to remember. <laughs> When your mission is clear, the money often follows. Yes. It's, all, it's always when, I think entrepreneurs, if they start a business because they want to chase money, those entrepreneurs usually don't build a very good business because they're, they're thinking, they're focusing on the wrong thing versus like, they're focusing on how can I make some money. Like It's very short-sighted short versus how can I add a lot of value to a lot of people's lives. And of course, when you do that, then money, money is always a byproduct of, of value creation, right? And I love like your book is, you know, I talk about money. I talk about wealth management. I talk about like a lot of different things. I don't make money, but it's very interesting because I study all your work. I've read all your books, right? Where, wow. and that the, like a lot of philosophies, I think is also great because a lot of people come to me because they want to learn a high income skill, right? They want to learn to make mm -hmm. money. But once you make the money, well, how do you, how do you manage it? Right? And, how do you and, keep it? Yeah. And how do you keep it? I guess most people don't know how to make money, right? Yeah, few and know how to keep it. Almost no one knows how to multiply it. I always say that, right? Um, it's very, very true. And so from there, once you make the money, how do you keep it? How do you invest it wisely, right? And also, I mean, wouldn't you agree, like David? Different people at different stage require different types of financial advice, right? If you're working in a job, you're not thinking of being an entrepreneur, right? You need a certain planning, right? Certain financial planning. If you're an entrepreneur, maybe you need something else. If you're running a you know global business, you need something else as well, right? So it all depends on, on, on where you're at. Now, what I'm very curious, I want to ask you this question about the book, is you talked about why you don't need to be rich to live rich, which I, I, I truly, truly believe in that. Because myself, I made that mistake, right? Oh, I thought, I thought, because the first 10 years of my business career, let's say from 20 to 30, 30 years old, right? I was the guy that, oh, I, I need to buy, I was getting a new car every year, right? I thought that's going to make me look cool. That, that's, that's what success is like, get a new right. car every year, right? You're, 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 you're going to fake it until you make it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was making, I was blowing it, it was dumb. Like, it was just like spending money. I was like being, not, not being very intelligent with money, right? Because money was coming in fast, but I was also spending it. Um, so talk to us about that. What's the concept about it? Well, first of all, let me just be totally transparent too, Dan. I, I, I did the same thing, right? Like, if you, you <laughs> I think we all have to go through that, right? We get it out of the system. You know, if you go back and you read the Automatic Millionaire book, yes. for some people who haven't read it, the, the, what happened to me, I thought, you know, I got out of college and I thought, when I first started making money, I made like 80000 I made $50,000, right? I'm, you know, you're out of school, you're like, that's a lot of money. Yes. But then I spent sixty. <laughs> so then I thought, well, if I can make 75, that's the number I need, right? And then, again, I'm in my early 20s, and then I spent 80 mm. or 90. And then I thought, well, the problem is, you know, you just got to make $100,000. So, yes. I, you know, I made $100,000, and again, I'm now spending more. And, and what happened is I'm teaching a class on investing for retirees. Mm. This couple comes into my office. I named Jim and Sue McIntyre. He's 52 years old. He wants to retire. He's wearing a short sleeve dress shirt with a little pocket protector. He's told me, Dan, that he's never made more than $55,000 in a year. Mm. And he wants to retire at 52. And I think to myself, well, this is going to be a terrible meeting. He's not going to have any money. Yes. And instead, he blows me away and shows, brings a paper bag into my office, lays out all the statements, and shows me that he's worth almost $2 million. Mm. And I was, the reason it blew me away was here I was making twice what he was as a young kid, mm. and I'm broke. 
Yes. And, you know, and the thing is, I'm broke, but I look rich. I have a lead, like I had a lease Jaguar, brand new, you yes. know, convertible. Had a gorgeous apartment in San Francisco. Yes. Did. Had a Rolex watch. I still have a Rolex watch, but like, yes. yeah, you know, and I, and I, I turned to this ordinary guy and said, you know, this ordinary couple and said, how did you do this? And he laughed at me because he's like, David, all the stuff you talked about in your class, like saving money, paying yourself first, automatically letting it compound, leaving it alone, buying real estate, paying down the debt. I did all that stuff. Mm. And, and it was, what happened was it woke me up to, it actually was a change your life moment. I, I, I left that meeting. They, they were, they, they didn't hire me. They were actually, cause I, I turned the meeting. I said, you know what? You guys came to hire me. I want to hear what you did. Will you just walk me through it? That's yeah. what led to the automatic millionaire book. Wow. I went home and I said, I took out a journal. I'm a big journaler. And I wrote into my journal for hours. And I basically said to myself, I am done looking rich. You want to be rich. I want to be rich. And what I, and what I really want to be is free because they skipped out of my office at 52 on the way to retirement with no financial worries. And I thought to myself, I'm going to, I'm going to start my life over tomorrow and I'm going to start going down the road that they went down. That changed my whole life. Mm. And what I will tell anybody who's listening is this. It is not what you make that matters it is what you keep. Yes. The thing that you can control the fastest is how you spend money. It's actually not how you make money. Mm. And I'm a big believer for making more and spending less, by the way. That's really key because if you can make more and spend less, you get free faster. Yes. I'll say that one more time. I can like, because people think, no, make more, spend less, get free faster. Yes. So a couple of things that led me to write like this book. So this is my third, I told you earlier, my 13th book. It's different than any book I've ever done because it's a, mm. it's a story. It's a parable. Mm. And what I've realized having written all these books, we, we've sold 7 million books, you know, prior to this one. Wow. 98% um, of people will never buy a financial book. Yes. And so, I, but, but people need the information, right? So I was like, how do I reach people that would normally not read a financial book or people buy financial books and then they never open them up and finish them. Yes. So, I, I basically kept for 10 years saying, I want to write the who moved my cheese of money. Ah, like, uh, yes. You know, the alchemist of personal finance. Yes. And so for 10 years, I had this dream. And then I went out and met Paulo Coelho, who wrote The Alchemist. Mm. And he asked me, you know, in Geneva, what's, what's the book your soul dreams of writing that it hasn't written, David? And I shared with him The Latte Factor. And he looked at me and said, well, then you need to go write it. Mm. So what I wanted to do with this book is help most people who actually haven't got going yet, especially young people. Yes. And here's, here's the problem, Dan. And you're in Canada. Canada and U.S. are pretty similar. Similar, very similar. In the U.S., this is an unbelievable statistic because we're the wealthy. In theory, we're the wealthiest country in the world. Yeah. The Federal Reserve did a does a survey now every year. They started it three years ago to, to try to really see what is wealth going like across America. Yeah. And 47% of Americans right now cannot get their hands on $400 in case of an emergency. Yeah. Paycheck six, to paycheck. Living six paycheck. At, yeah, living paycheck to paycheck. Six out of 10 Americans can't get their hands on $1,000 mm -hmm. in case of emergency. But they're all, they're all, a lot of those people are holding, you know, they're carrying their $1,000 iPhone. Yeah. Right? So what I decided to do is write this little parable, the story that would show you that, you know, 5 to $10 a day could change your whole life. Yes. And, and, you know, there's all the, this book takes you on a journey with a young woman named Zoe Daniels, who's a 27 year old millennial who works right behind me in the freedom tower. Cause that's where the freedom tower is. Mm -hmm. I live here in New York city and at 27, she's living paycheck to paycheck. She's been working for six years in New York, making more money every year, mm -hmm. but she's broke. She's got student debts. She's got college. She's got, college. Debts. Mm -hmm. she's got student loans. She's got credit card debt. She's renting. And she's depressed. What, what she has, what's happened to her, which is happening to too many millennials, there's mm. 77 million millennials in the U.S., mm. is that she, the light in her is going out. She's giving up hope. Mm. And so what happens is she comes, she's walking through the Oculus and she sees this LCD screen that's like a football field long. It's, if you ever come to New York, I'll take you and show this to you. Mm. And on this LCD screen, she sees this boat that's sitting on a desert. Like mm. weird, right? And then these words pop up that say, if you don't know where you're going, you might not like where you end up. Mm. And it jars her, right? Because it's true. If you don't know where you're going, you might not like where you end up. Yes. And she, and she takes the escalator up and she comes up above ground right over here. 
at the 9-11 Memorial. And normally she walks right by the 9-11 Memorial, but today she sits down and she starts to ask herself where she's going with her life. Mm -hmm. And then she goes into her office and mm -hmm. she tells her boss that she's broke, that she's living paycheck to paycheck, that she can't afford anything. Ultimately, her boss introduces her to a gentleman who runs a coffee shop. Mm. and this gentleman becomes one of her mentors that teaches her that small amounts of money can change everything. Mm. And one of the things he shows her is that if she could just save $10 a day and start to pay herself first, mm. she could be a multimillionaire. Yes. And she's like, come on, that can't possibly be. And she's like, he's like, that coffee that you're drinking here, like literally, like you don't have to give up the coffee. It could be something else. But mm. $10 a day, and just go to some simple basic math, $10 a day is $300 a month. It's not a lot, $10 a day. It's, more, mm -hmm. it's less than people make an hour on average. Most people yes. who will watch this with us or listen to us yes. are, are making, more than 10, they're making more than $10 an hour. Yep. And so if you were in your 20s and you started by paying yourself first $10 an hour, I'm mean, sorry, sorry, $10 a day, I run the math for you and I show you by the time you hit 65, you could have nearly $2 million mm. in an investment account. Mm. And when she starts to see this, she starts to change the way she behaves. Mm. So that's so powerful because I think the latte factor, what you're talking about, is a metaphor, right? It's not so much like, because I think there's a difference between, you know, there's things you enjoy in life, and sometimes those things maybe don't cost you a lot of money. Right. It's not so much about, hey, if I make a 50, I make 100,000, then all my problems go away. Well, not if you don't change your spending habit. Right, because you can see like middle class, they could be making a hundred doctors, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand, broke in debt, even even worse off than people who are making fifty thousand. Regularly, you know, again as a financial advisor, I would regularly see doctors and lawyers who make right? three, four, five hundred thousand a year. They've got a huge home, huge yeah. mortgage, country club payment, two kids in private school, and they're broke. Yeah. and they're stressed yes. because they have to keep making that amount of money. A while back, I did a CNBC show here in New York, and I talked about, this is a long time ago, because it was with a guy named Donnie Deutsch. Then Deutsch, yes. and, and I did a show with Donnie where somehow we went off on this tangent on how people, how do you, how, he goes, how does the people end up broke on a million dollars a year in income? And, it, and I start telling Danny how this happened. Well, Danny, here's exactly how it happens. In New York, you make a million dollars, because this happens, believe it or not, all the time. You make a million dollars in New York after taxes, you actually made about five fifty. Yes. And you, you got yourself a multi-million dollar apartment with a huge mortgage and yes. two kids in private school and you rent a home in the Hamptons and you're broke. Yes. And, 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 you know, we know people like this, like Donnie and I do. And, and that week I would walk down the street in New York City where people yeah. don't usually come up and talk to you. But like New York City, like, because we're very cool, like nobody comes up and goes, hey, you, yeah. you can be the biggest star in the world and nobody's coming over and saying a word to you. It's not, it's not chic. Yes. Um, but people are coming up to me like, dude, that was great on Donnie Deutsch. It's totally true. There are people who are broke on a million dollars a year. Now, yeah. that's so obnoxious to say because I know that people are listening to this and they really are broke. Mm. But I, I, I tell the story to point out that it, it's not income or, or, or how much you make that frees you unless you learn how to hold on to your money. Mm. And then the people who truly become free, they learn how to make their money work for them. Yes. Right? Because there's a point at which you don't want to work anymore. Like yeah, or, you I'm, can't, or you can't work or you can't work as or, or you can't work. Yeah. Like, like really, I just did an, an online course we've got called the Latte Factor course. And, and people can go to my website later. It's davidbach.com. They can get this, this course I created. It's very inexpensive. It's like, and I showed on this course, I said, you know, people, th there's a big, huge myth in America and probably mm. Canada too, but especially in America that, yes. that people are going to just work until they're 70 now. Yeah. You know, like they don't have enough money. So they're they just, gonna, they're going to just keep working. But here, here's the thing that's happened that people don't know. Half of Americans who have a job today, a corporate job, will be forced out of that corporate job in their 50s. Mm. No one in corporate America today, I sit in the capital of corporate America in New York City, no one in corporate America who's sitting in a boardroom right now is looking to hold on to 50-year-old employees. Mm. They're not. They don't want employees in their 60s. They're too expensive. Mm. They want young people who are one-third the cost. Mm. so you're just not a lot of you who have corporate jobs and the people who watch you also are entrepreneurs and they want to be entrepreneurs it's a good time to be looking at how you're going to transition to entrepreneurship mm. because if you have a corporate job there's a good chance in 10 years you won't you won't and yeah. so I, I just tell you this the next 10 years are the 10 years that you need to focus on buying your financial freedom
And yeah. we can go into really specific steps, but the mental mindset of this is really important. You have to realize it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And you have to use this time that you're trading for money to free yourself financially or it just won't get better for you. And I think I see one of the mistakes a lot of people make is they say to themselves, almost like fool themselves. Oh yeah, yeah, David, I got it. Dan, I got it. Once I make more, you don't understand. Once I make more, then, then, then I'll put money aside. Like I'm making 100K, just let me make 200K, then, then I'll put no, money aside. I'll do it. Not true. Well, <laughs> so not- entrepreneurs are the worst. Like I've, I've been an EO, entrepreneurs organization for yes. 18 years. I just spoke and did like a final going away talk for my group here in New York City. And one of the problems with entrepreneurs is that entrepreneurs, look, we're, we are all, by trade, we're usually very optimistic, yes. right? Like all in kind of guy, right? All, and, and, you know, bet on ourselves to win, which is yes. beautiful. Yes. But what we do when we build these businesses, is we keep reinvesting the money to keep growing. Yes. And too many entrepreneurs don't take chips off the table. Yes. And, and, and there's only three ways my entrepreneur friends to build wealth, three yeah. of them. Yes. One is you make money and you take someone off the table, you take some off the table and you keep it. Yeah. That means you're putting it into a, a retirement account, like a SEP IRA or defined benefit plan or you yep. know, where you guys are, it's an RSP. Yep. Plan. But you've got to move money off the table. Yep. The second thing is you move up money off the table and you put it into an investment that now makes you additional money outside your business, like real yes. estate. Like yes. The best thing you can do when you're self-employed is yes. buy a building or a condo and yep. rent back from it and own that asset 10 years later yep. for clear. Yeah. And the third thing is you have an exit in your business. You sell your business. If you're lucky. <laughs> That's the key. Yeah. Most entrepreneurs count on the third thing, which is selling it. And most entrepreneurs' businesses are not saleable. Yes. And if, if you don't know if your business is saleable today, the answer is it's not, right? Like <laughs> I, 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 three years ago, I became a co- I've been in financial services for 20 years, 26 yes. years. I, three years ago, started a registered investment advisory firm. We're one of the fastest growing RIAs in America. We just, we're about to go over $8 billion in assets on our platform. I teach financial advisors how to build a business and sell these businesses. Mm. The beauty of being a financial advisor, I know all day long what these businesses sell for. I know exactly what you need to do to go get a two or three or four or five or six or, mm. or 10x multiple. Yeah. And, and there's all these buyers for the financial service industry. And our business is residualized income. They're That's not creating right. something, making money, got to go create it again. You yeah. bring on, you know, you get paid as long as you keep the client, you get paid on these assets. Correct. So it's a great business. And yeah. most entrepreneurs actually often, they don't have a great business and it's not saleable, which means you've got to nail number one and number two on how you build wealth. Yes. You take tips off the table. You got to buy assets that build revenue outside your business. That's I, I totally agree with that because that's one thing I teach in, in, in my book, Wealth Triangle. Is I said you have a business, but you got to put that into high return investments because most entrepreneurs they are high income underinvested. And yeah. do you also notice this, David? That I think the very skills that it takes to be a great entrepreneur, they are the opposite skills that you need to be a great investor, right? Yes, and the reason is. Again, as, I'm an, as an entrepreneur, we'll take risk being an entrepreneur. That's correct. But you, I actually, I'm a very conservative investor. Yes. I, and, and when I manage money for our clients and I talk about, I just did a you know, 10 city tour speaking primarily to our mm. clients. And I always say, look, guys, we want you to have an exciting life and a boring investment plan. Yes. We, we want your investments to be boring. You know, if you're 65 years old and, you, and you're on the golf course talking about how, you've met, how your money's invested, something's wrong with something it. is wrong yes <laughs> you're about to lose it right like yes. so we're not trying to help our clients get rich we're trying to keep our help our clients stay wealthy and yeah. i'll tell anybody this once you get to the, there's nothing sadder than making your first million dollars and then losing it yeah and so you know i you want to have a diversified portfolio that your goal with money is to earn somewhere between seven to ten percent annually yes if you can just do that you double your money every 10 years now yes you know today people want to like have a thousand percent return because, because we read about it. We see all these unicorn businesses and we hear all these crazy stories and we watch yeah. Bitcoin go, go like this and go like that. Mm-hmm. All I know is if you're trying to get rich quick, you're going to stay broke forever. Yes. Yes. And, and it's not about making that return in, in one year. It's making that return on a consistent basis. That's the difficult part, right? The name of the game is not getting rich, it's staying rich. It's interesting because I look at most entrepreneurs, some of them, I mean, I'm sure you've met them, that okay, they have a great year. Well, let's see what happens the second year. Let's see what happens the third year. Let's see if you study. 
See what happens in 10 years. Yeah, like a lot of them aren't even around in five, 10 years anymore, right? They're, they're, they're nowhere to be seen. I mean, in, in my space, it could be in the education space, it could be in a training space. We've seen a lot of speakers come and go. We've seen experts come and go, right? How it's many? Very, it's very hard to have duration really in anything, right? Like most speakers do not, most speakers, authors, they don't last 10 years, no. right? Like I have, I put out an update to smart women finish rich ladies. You should go get that book. But first book you want to get is the latte factor. We'll make sure we sell this book today. Yes. Uh, but the smart women finish rich just came out for its 20 year anniversary edition. It sold more than a million copies. It sell, it will sell more copies this year than mm. it sold 10 years ago. Yes. And people go, how is that possible? Well, cause it's really good content. It yes. works. Yes. And guess what? I'm still pushing. 26 years later, still I'm pushing. still pushing. Yes. And, and so, you know, most people don't have it in them to keep pushing for 20 years. They don't, they don't, and part of it is they don't really love what they do, right? They're just trying to do it for the money. Yeah. One, of my, one of my money mentors is, you know, Warren Buffett, which, by the way, anybody can be mentored by Warren Buffett because there's so much content out there. Yes. And I go to the – I own Berkshire Hathaway. I go to the Berkshire Hathaway conferences. Um, you know, they, he buys companies that he's going to hold – can hold for decades yeah. that don't go out of style. Yes. And, and, and there's you know, nice and boring. Like you said, nice and boring. Totally and, boring. Drinking yeah. his little Coca-Cola. Like with, it doesn't get any boring than that. Right. <laughs> with his C's candy, you know, and put, owns bank of America and Wells Fargo. And yeah. you know, it's, it's just, and these businesses just kick off cash flow. Yeah. And then he takes the cash and goes and puts it in another great business. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, I'll go off on some tangents here, but I was with a guy who had done 21,000 Uber rides. Mm. Right, so I'm I'm in Uber. He's tell, he's got twenty one done twenty one thousand. He's like he's been doing Uber for like five years. He's like at the Stop top yeah. of Uber. Yeah. So I ask an obvious question. Yes. Oh, did you buy Uber stock? Yes. And he goes, No. Why would I buy Uber stock? I said, You've been working for Uber for five years. Do you think Uber is going to continue to succeed? He's you know, yes. Well, why wouldn't you invest in it then? Yes. And he says, Well, how much do you think it's going to go up this year? I said, who cares what it goes up this year? I mean, yes. I, I own Uber. I, 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 I'm putting Uber away for, I'm not going to look at it for 10 years. Yes. If Uber tripled in the next 12 months, I'm still not going to sell it. And the reason yes. is, by the way, I just told somebody else's story. I did that with Amazon. I regretted it. Uh, <laughs> I bought Amazon early and sold it too early. Yes. And Facebook. And so I've, like, some of these, I just want to buy them and put them away. Mm. Um, and certain companies, you know, they, they, they come out and they, they have a head start in this, in a category that mm. I'm not here to sell Uber. I'm just using this as an example. Like one of the examples I use in Latte Factor is that uh, Zoe gets taken to a coffee shop by her mentor, Henry. Mm. And Henry actually takes her into a Starbucks. Mm. And, and he says to her, you know, when Starbucks opened around the corner for me, all my friends were all mad that we're in the coffee business. He said, I didn't get mad. I bought the stock. Because he owned a coffee shop and he was worried about being put out of business. He's like, I'm not, instead of being mad, I'm going to go invest in Starbucks. Yeah. And, you, know, you, can't, you, can't, you can't beat them. You joined them. <laughs> right. And he tells her, he says, look, you know, if you put $1,000 in Starbucks, do you know what we'd be worth over, two, when it started, when it was public, it'd be worth over $250,000. Yes. So he says to her, like, look, if you don't want to stop going here, then make sure you buy the stock. Yes. And that's an important thing. Like, every day we spend money. The question is, are you spending money to make your... It, the money goes out and either makes you poor or it makes you richer. Yes. So you have to look at how you're spending money and put it into something that can make you wealthier. Mm, I, I love that. And one of the questions I teach all my students say, whatever purchase you make, just ask yourself, is this going to make me richer or is this going to make me poor? Right? It's one of those two, right? It could be an investment. It's, it's, it's one of those two. It's it, one of those two. And here's, so I, I, you know, I've gotten a lot of attention lately for something I've said is if I get, if I, if, some, if all of a sudden I die in the next, you know, few years, mysteriously, it will be because somebody in the car industry shot me. Like, because I, because I've been coming out and telling people the dumbest thing you can ever do mm. is buy a new car. Mm. But the money that is spent marketing to Americans to buy new cars new car. is billions and billions of dollars, right? And yes. the average American today who buys a new car has a $533 payment. Yes. And they buy that car and they drive it off the lot. And the yes. moment you drive it off the lot, it's worth 20, 30% less. And yep. two years later, it's worth 50%. And yep. they borrowed the money to do this. Yes. You and pay, pay interest. You don't want to borrow money to buy things that go down in value. Mm. You want to borrow money to buy things that can go up in value, like real estate. Yes. And so, you know, people get all, I go, look, 
go go buy a go go buy a car that's coming off of a two year lease. Yes. Fifty cents on the dollar. It's still brand new. Yes. Right. Like I'm getting ready to move to Florence, Italy in 30 days. You're my second to the last interview I'm going to do for the year. Oh, nice. Uh, and and um, my family and I moved to Florence, Italy. So we've, we've sold our apartment. We're getting rid of our car. Our car. I have a car downstairs. It's leased. Mm. And that car, I'm going to, because that's, that's a business car, right? Like, I'm going to turn that car back into the BMW, and it's got less than 6,000 miles on it. Mm. Someone's going to get to buy that car now. It's brand new. For a great deal. For 50 cents on the dollar. Now, I've yeah. also bought cars for cash. Like, the car before that was a DB9. Mm. Somebody else paid 270000 for it, mm. and I bought it for ninety. <laughs> Yes. And it was basically brand new. And I drove the car for two years and turned around and sold it back to the dealership for 80. Yes. So I drove my DB9 convertible for less than the average guy who's driving a Hyundai. That's right. So there's a lot of ways to get what you want. Yes. Be smart about it with your money. Yes. Um, you know, because I'm not against having stuff. Believe me. I mean, I, it's funny. I, I bought a boat, a brand new boat once from Chris Craft when the recession hit. There were boat dealerships going bankrupt. So the banks were taking back these boats and just getting rid of them. Yes. I bought a brand new boat <laughs> off of a bankruptcy and then used that boat for seven years and then almost sold it for what I paid for it. That's being smart. That's being smart right. with money. Yeah. So yeah. We said, that's why it's not being like frugal. Or like David is saying, like, don't live live and just like don't drink that coffee. It's not what we're talking about here. Not at all. Not at all. If you got it, money. You know, we're saying the opposite. We're saying enjoy life, live life. Don't let money restrict you what you could or could not do. But we're saying be smart about it, right? Be intelligent. One of the underlying themes of this book is live rich now. It's not just about putting money off for 40 years and then having a good life. It's also figuring out how to have the life you want right today. Now. Yep, I agree. And part of that, Zoe learns in the book, is that she needs to have a dream account. She needs to, she needs to identify what her dreams are, mm. get clear with, uh, about them, mm. so that she's got a reason to put money aside. Like in Zoe Daniel's case, mm. she's a travel editor. This is the woman in the book. She's a travel editor that has never traveled. Wow. <laughs> and so she really wow. wants to travel abroad. And so she starts to learn how to save money for that. Mm. I, here's the key with, with money. Partially, it's question-based. Like, if you ask a question to yourself, why am I so broke? Mm. Like, that's what Zoe was doing in the beginning. Why am I always so broke? When you ask yourself a question like that, your brain will work on answering it. You're yep. so broke because you're stupid. You're so broke because your parents weren't good with money. You're mm. so broke because you'll never be good with money. Like you will answer the wrong question if you ask the wrong question. Yeah. If you ask a question that's like, how could I have the money to do what I want to do? Mm. What would I have to go do to create that money to go have my dream? Mm. Who would I have to go study to mm. learn how to have more money? Mm. How could I up level my skill set to make more money? Mm. Oh, I watched one of your videos once straight out of Dale Carnegie where you did that. Yes. Tell me this pen, right? Yes. I, I took a Dale Carnegie class in yes. 1990 when I got out of college. You know, I was in commercial <laughs> The first thing that we did was sell me this pen. That's right. But you know what? That's a great lesson. Mm. Those are timeless lessons. Most people don't know how to sell. You know what? If you don't know how to sell, you, well, first of all, you could just make a whole lot more money. <laughs> when you know how to sell that's right doesn't matter what you do it doesn't matter nope. if you have business for your own it doesn't it's, it's all communication right it, it's and also it, you, there's no level which you don't have to sell if you've got children you're selling every day you just don't realize it, it depends yes. on what you're selling them right yes. yes and i tell people if you're single it means because you can't sell that's why you remain <laughs> single <laughs> right you can you don't know sell yourself right no one wants to go on a date right right totally yeah. And David talked to us about, like, as one concept you talk about in the book, in the book it's the, what, what do you mean by being financially selfish? Why, why do we have to do that? So Zoe was raised with parents that basically told her money wasn't important, right? Like a lot of times people say money's not important. Money won't make you happy. Mm. And that was her upbringing. By the way, her parents were pretty much broke. You know, like yes. they didn't have a lot of money. Yes. And so she was taught, like, don't be selfish, focus on other people. And what the one lessons her mentor, Henry, teaches her is it's actually the first lesson. Mm -hmm. You have to become financially selfish. And she's like, well, what, what do you mean? He's yeah, like, I'm not a selfish person. Like, well, what right. do you mean by that? Yeah. And he says, well, look, when you go to, he goes, what time do you go to work? And she says, well, I go to work at nine. He goes, and when do you leave? I leave at five. And he's like, okay, the, you have to become selfish for your paycheck. He's like, the first person who needs to be paid is you. 
And he says, you know, have you heard of this phrase, pay yourself first? Yes. And she's like, I, I think so. And he's like, well, do you know what it means? And she's like, you know, I take the money I make and I, I spend it. I treat myself. Mm. He's like, well, not really. That's not actually it. Mm. <laughs> what pay yourself first means is that when you get paid, the first person you pay is you, but you put it away for your future self. Yes. So he teaches her the first hour. This is what you want to do if you have a job. First hour day of your income from nine to 10 o'clock. That's your first hour. Whatever you make an hour, you pay yourself first. You mm. put the money in a retirement account before you mm. can touch it. Mm. And then you don't budget because budgeting doesn't work. You move the money automatically. Yes. Now, a lot of people who are watching this who are self-employed, this is where they get, they get lost because they go, well, see, this stuff doesn't work for me because I don't have a job. Yeah, but when, you, but when you earn money, you can still pay yourself first. You just have to make a decision that 10 cents on every dollar, the moment that money comes in, you're going to sweep it off the side and put it away into these investments. Yeah. Because if you don't do that, you just won't have the money. Yeah. So that's what it means. It means to put yourself first by paying yourself first. Th those are the three. See, pay yourself first are the three most important words in the financial language. Yes. Pay yourself so, first. first. Yeah, and more every, accurately, really, is it pay your future self first. Yeah. So don't get confused. It's not, pay, oh, yeah, yeah let, let me go buy that thing. Let me go take on that trip. That, that's not paying yourself. That's paying the bank. That's paying the brands. That pay, that's paying the, the car company first. That's not yeah, paying. It, it's not treat yourself first. Because yeah, not treat yourself first is not what we're talking about. Because what happens is, you know, marketing is all about, we're basically trained, almost hypnotized. Yes. That when we come into money, we need to reward ourselves. Yes. You know, like somebody we, just. If we work so hard for it, I've sacrificed so much. I, I work long hours, right? I, I, I deserve to, to indulge a little bit. I deserve to spend a little bit of money on myself, right? We have, we have thousands of people on our Facebook insider team for this book. And it's become a real community on our Facebook group. And people can go to the lattefactor.com. It's going to be open a few more weeks if yes. they want to get inside our group. But everybody is talking to each other, supporting each other. So one, yes. one of the women who read the book who's been seeing the things I'm teaching and she's trying to get her daughter to do this. And she saw my video about mm. on CNBC about don't buy a car. Yes. She said, you know, I'm trying to get my daughter to read this book. And, and, and she, cause she's about to graduate college next week yeah. and she's got some money. And what she wants to do is buy herself a new car because she wants, she's like, mom, I've earned it. I've worked so hard. And, and, and this mom is like, no, you have to read this book. You need to take this money and either buy a piece of real estate or mm -hmm. keep it to invest in yourself, but don't go buy a new car. Mm -hmm. But the daughter's been programmed through marketing to go reward herself and, sh and like show her success. Like you and I were talking about, oh, mm -hmm. look at me. Um, there was a, I, I did a, a, a I know I'm, we're talking about a lot of stuff here, but I did a show called The Breakfast Club. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with The Breakfast Club. It's, Breakfast a, Club. It's, it's the biggest urban radio show in America, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's here in New York City. Mm. So I'm, I'm doing this radio show and on all the, you know, they always have all the, all the, all the stars, you know, all the rapper stars and the urban stars and, mm. uh, and they're, they come on these shows with like a lot of jewelry, mm. right? So there's pictures of all these guys with like the, all the bling, all the bling, right? right? A million dollars in diamonds hanging around yeah, their neck. Yeah, and I said, yeah. you know, I said something on the show. I go, you know, when you're wearing jewelry around your neck, that's worth more than your net worth. Yeah. That's dumb. Yes, hey, something, something is wrong. <laughs> something is wrong. And here's what's so funny. I'm sure you've watched Gary V. Like, our, you know, everybody sees Gary V videos, right? Yes. Gary Vanderchuk. And, and, and literally today he put up this video, which showed, um, oh my God, I'm going to blank on his name right now. And he lives in my neighborhood here in Tribeca. Beyonce is, what, what's Beyonce's husband's name again? Uh, Jay-Z. Jay-Z. He, yes. he's, he's, he's got a picture of Jay-Z. They're side by side. The first picture of Jay-Z is with all this gold bling around him. And oh, yes, when he was, uh, he was really, yeah, young, he was much younger, rich. right? Yeah. And his net worth then was $100,000. Yes. The second picture is him and it's like totally just casual, like yeah, in a Very cool, yeah, yeah. And it's $600 million. That's right. <laughs> and That's and right. Gary, Gary's video today was making the point like, isn't that interesting? When he didn't have money, he was trying to look rich. And now that he's rich, totally doesn't chill. Care. doesn't care. That's true. It's very, very true. That's what I want for those of you who are listening and watching us. I want you to have the peace of mind and freedom. That's really it. It's the peace of mind because when you have financial freedom, when you're not living paycheck to paycheck, when you haven't over leveraged yourself, when you're not trying to look wealthier than you are, mm. you're, you will be happier. Yes. That's stress.
less stress. And and I think a lot of time we money is such an emotionally charged subject, right? It's 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 one of those subjects where people. Th- I always tell people when you have money problems, usually there's something going on deeper than that, right? Either you maybe you have negative association with money, or maybe you have negative beliefs about money, or say you know, I'm not good with money, or your parents were not good at good with money. They they taught you some of these beliefs, right? Or you're trying to, you have insecurities, you want to use money to cover that up or whatever. It's, it's, it's always something deeper going on, right? It's usually the money, how much you have or don't have it. It's a result of something much, much deeper. And the problem is people try to fix the symptom, right? And I love your work because you go into, let's, let's talk a little bit deeper about this. And what you've done is you've given people the, the, the system. Forget budgeting. I don't yep. even want you to think about it because I don't trust your willpower. Let's just do this automatically because <laughs> you and I know you don't have that much discipline. So forget the discipline. Forget you'll get to it. Forget you'll remember. Let's just do it automatically. You're going to put money in your emergency fund. You're going to put it in your dream account. You're going to invest it. Let's not even, I don't even want you to think about it, right? That's, that's, the, that's really your philosophy. Dan, I, think you, I know you posted a video that said discipline. I think you said that discipline doesn't work, right? It doesn't I, work. I, I always say discipline doesn't work. And, and if you think discipline's going to work, you're doomed for failure. Yeah. I, I, having managed all this money for people who built real wealth on ordinary income, yes. none of them did it through discipline. Yes. They all did it through automatic investing, systematic investing. And they did it over decades. That's another important point. Yes. People don't get rich in years. They get rich in decades. Yes. And so the thing that's hard for people, because you've got a lot of young people that will listen to yes. this and watch yes. this. When you're 25, you actually can't really believe that someday you're going to be 60. <laughs> you're right? you, you, you just, it just, people who are that age, they, they just seem like they're dead. Like they're so, I'll never, like, you're going to blink your eyes, my young friends, and you're going to be 50. Yes. And you're going to be 50 with wealth yes. or not. But yes. you're going to be 50 with less energy than you usually have in your 20s. 100%. 100%. And so your older self is going to thank you for the work you did in your 20s. <laughs> it's like now, like before, remember, like in my 20s, I can pull all nighter. I can work long hours, no problem. Yeah. Now I'm like, I sit in front of a computer in like a few hours. Of, ah, you know, my back hurts. My shoulder hurts. You know, I can't, I can't type as much, right? I'm like, what is this? It, seriously, <laughs> it's true. Well, and you're about to go travel, right? Like, you know, yeah. when you're traveling in your 20s and your 30s, it's yeah. like, you know, it's like fun, you know, yeah. but then you like, then you don't want to be away from home. You don't want to sleep out of your bed and you don't want to deal with the airports. And even if you're flying private, you still got different issues. And, you know, it's funny, like I'm going to go do a TV show in Times Square at 830 tonight. And I'm like, really? Why did I agree to do this TV show at 830? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's true. It's true. You have less energy and, and you just, you don't want to do as much and you cannot do as much. So it's setting yourself up. Like I, I couldn't agree with that more. It's very rich. Before you know it, boom. Now, David, thing, you go ahead. Yeah. So I want to give my, my audience, my listeners, that we've talked about some principles, right? We've talked about the book. I want, to, I want them to walk away with, give them some, some steps. They say someone, a millennial, they just graduate. Maybe they have a little bit of student loan. What advice? Like give, them, give them some steps. What do they need to do? Yeah. Order? So I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll kind of like really chunk this down for you. Yes. One thing is go figure out where your money's going. Okay. Right? One. Because, because, because you, 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 you have to believe you have the money in order to start saving and investing. So yes. go find your latte factor. Take two days and track where your money goes. Just look at, look at every single line of expense. Yeah. I mean, look, you can also just take a pad of paper and write down where you're spending money for two days as you go through your day. Yeah. There are great apps out there that can help you track your money. I'm an investor in a company called Clarity Money. We sold it to our friends back here at Goldman Sachs. Mm. Clarity Money is, a web, is an app that you can download. Mm. that you put your credit cards and you're checking into it and you'll see where all your money is going in mm. like in minutes, right? Like you'll be able to track everything. It'll mm. also show you where you're putting money into monthly subscription. Ah, uh, yes. Where people are taking your money automatically from you. Yes. And there's a, it, it'll summarize it for you on your phone. And when you start to see that you're spending two, three, four hundred dollars $400 a month, which is very common, Mm-hmm. You know, it's fifty dollars here. It's seventy dollars there. It's nineteen. Yeah, maybe there's some subscriptions you don't even need anymore, right? You, you, don't even, you, don't, you don't use them. I would go. I would go through those subscription fees and anything that you don't absolutely have to have that's like life critical. I'd get rid of them. Yeah. Um, I'd hit the unsubscribe button or the uh, you know and that's on this app. Yeah. The second thing I do is I go get an automatic investment account set up. Another company. I'm I'm just full disclosure. These are companies that I've invested in. Yeah. They're, they're like the big companies. One of them is a company called Acorns. Mm. Acorns is the fastest growing online app for saving and investing small amounts of money. There's, we have over, there's over 5 million people now in Acorns. Yeah. Uh, 
um, it's a very millennial focused website and I can go check out acorns.com since mm. you've got a vehicle to save money automatically. I, I, it's so funny because my buddy just reached out to me. Uh, I'm going to see him tomorrow. He's a really successful entrepreneur mm. and he's got a 15 year old and he's like, Hey, what's, what's your favorite financial app for teens? I go acorns.com. And he's like, Oh yeah, you told me about that two years ago. And then he sends me a screenshot of his acorns account from just rounding up his change. Mm. And he saved $10,000 in Whoa. Since the last time I saw him, like, so he's like, he's like, yeah, I forgot about that. That was a great little tool. Yeah. Um, and he, and, and so then, then I would tell you if you have a 401k plan mm. or you have an RSP account, yes. you have a job yes. where they're offering these plans, your number one thing that you should do for watching this show with us is you need to go sign up for that plan and yes. you need to be saving one hour a day of your income. Yeah. That equates to 12 and a half percent of your gross income. Yeah. The formula to being rich without worry is, yes. it, is, is if you're in your 20s and your 30s, it's saving yeah. an hour a day of your income. The yeah. average person who will be watching this today, who's got a 401k plan, he's like, okay, I'm doing this. They're not saving that much. The average savings rate in America right now is about 6% of yeah. people who have a plan. Yeah. Many people are only saving 3%. Yeah. It's simply not enough money. You've got to go up that. I agree. If all you do from watching this show is increase that by one or two percent, then this show was it was worth this hour in time. Mm-hmm. I remember. Then, I think I was reading a book by Sir John Templeton. Um, that he was talking about in the beginning of his career, he was spending ninety nine percent of what he earns, right? And by the time he's built a Templeton fund, and everything he's spending one percent of his what he wow. earns. Right? Like imagine from the opposite of that. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. So yeah, it's for sure, sure. like the three, four percent, it's not enough. And I love what David said. The, the more you earn, right, the more you save, you put aside. And you're going to invest. We're not just talking about just holding on. You invest wisely, right? The faster you'll be free. So, uh, so then the next step I would tell you is you have to invest your money for growth. Yeah. So what you can't do is put your money in a checking account and have it earn 0% or 1%. That is not what you, you need to, at a minimum on cash, be earning over 2% today because that's where rates are. Yep. And then your, your retirement money or your longer term money should be diversified. It should be at least 60, I believe 60% stock, 40% bonds. That's going to give you a diversified portfolio where historically they've earned somewhere between seven and a half to eight and a half percent annually. Um, and for those who are younger, you can take a little bit more risk, but don't take a lot of risk. Just take mm-hmm. enough that your money's growing. Your yes. money's got to grow. So it doubles every 10 years. Yes. Uh, there's a rule called the rule 72. The rule 72 is, you take 72, the number, mm-hmm. you divide it by the rate of return, it tells you how many years it takes to double your money. Yes. So if you take, you probably taught this, right? Yes. If you take 72 and you divide it by 10%, you double your money in a little over seven years. Yes. Look, that works all day long. That's a great formula to building wealth, but you have to have your money growing. Too many people take this money and then their money doesn't work for them. Yes. And it's so interesting because sometimes I, I have millennials, young people that come to me. So, so okay, so I get it. So, Dan, I'm going to put aside some money. I'm going to invest it. I'm going to make grow. So, when I'm going to spend it? Yeah. Like, is it, is it two years or three years? I said, no, you don't touch it. No, no, but like, where am I going to spend it? Where am I going to pour it out? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to buy that Porsche. I'm going to... No, you don't touch it. Well, that retirement money you don't touch. That's why you need a second bucket. You need your dream account. Yeah, have that dream bucket. Yeah, that's your fun it's, money. It's, that's the, dream, okay. the dream account, you can go and spend it. Now, ideally, the key is you start to build assets. And my grandmother used to say, don't ever kill the golden goose. Yes, you can exactly. spend the You can spend the eggs like what the golden goose produces. Don't kill, don't kill the goose. But don't kill the goose. And what that means is you put money into an investment. You don't spend the investment. You spend the dividends. That's right. That's right. And that's what and, I, I do myself, 100%. You, you acquire assets, you buy assets, you build assets, and then you spend the dividends. Enjoy life. Just yeah. don't go and goose. The last thing I'd say is, uh, you know, get in the game of real estate. There's only two asset classes that build wealth, stocks and real estate. Those are the two primary assets that are the primary escalators to building wealth. Mm. Uh, I'm just a huge proponent in owning a home. Don't be a renter long-term. Buy your first piece of property. Mm. I remember coming to Vancouver. I used to have a partnership with Scotia Bank. Yeah, and yes. I, it was like, I think we were back in 2007. We were going across Canada and, and you know, I'm coming from the U.S., right? I, I'm in Vancouver. Like, I think real estate prices were $500 a square foot. Oh. And, I, and I would look out and go, God, you guys don't realize how cheap this is. Yeah. I'm from San Francisco. I live in New York. All this real estate is going to be over a thousand dollars a square foot, and then it's going to be over fifteen dollars a square foot. People are like, really? You think so? Yep. And yep. That's exactly what happened, right? Like you're smiling. Yep. People made a fortune on that real estate in the last ten yep. years. Yeah. Um, 
You're going to be a lot. Of, now it's one of the most expensive cities in the world, right? New York, Japan, Vancouver, Hong Kong, obviously. Yeah, one of the top, definitely one of the top 10, 100%. You know, and part of too, like, look, if you happen to live in a city like Manhattan where I live or you live in Vancouver where you are, you, you, you want to buy real estate where money's moving. Oh, yes. Yes. Because when you buy, you know, it, people, people go, oh, you got lucky living and re- buying real estate in San Francisco or New York. Well, look, it was more expensive to live here. Yeah. But, you know, you, you make your own luck, right? Like you move, you buy real estate where people are moving to. Yes. You're, you have a better chance of being on a faster escalator to wealth. You yeah. buy real estate where people are moving out of or don't want to come to yes. yeah the real estate's cheap because there's a reason it's cheap <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. yes you, you, get, you get what you pay for yeah and i think like certain cities like say in vancouver you have the 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 nature the urban um the the sea like a little bit like there are a lot of advantages of like, that's why i choose like so many different places i could live i choose to live here because I, I love love this place one question before we go what's your take on cryptocurrency so let me tell you let, let, i just talked about facebook yesterday right because yes. facebook's about to roll out their own version of a yeah, yeah yeah so so pull cryptocurrency aside and talk about blockchain for a moment blockchain the way money moves on blockchain is going to be a complete game changer for our future yeah. Money is going to move differently. Yeah. So I've always said none of this is real until companies like Facebook and Amazon get into the game of cryptocurrency. Yeah. You know, Amazon hasn't made any announcements. I'm not making any, I'm just making what I, to me, it's a no brainer for Amazon to create their own cryptocurrency, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you don't trust Amazon. Yeah. So you're shopping inside Amazon. If anybody was going to become their own crypto, have their own cryptocurrency. It's Amazon. Right? Yeah. Facebook is not as natural, but it's genius, right? Like Facebook's already looking at how to diversify their business yeah. and they have billions of people's names. Yeah. So it's, it's very smart. But in terms of like buying cryptocurrency to get rich, I think it's crazy. You know, you know I go around these, kind, I go around and I do seminars and, and again, I'm in front of thousands and thousands of real people. And I always, yeah. I've asked the last two years, how many of you, raise your hand, if you've bought anything with Bitcoin? Yeah. And nobody raises their hand. Yeah. Right. So the fact that people are buying Bitcoin, they're not, they go, well, Bitcoin's an investment. No, it's gambling. Yes. I, I speculation. Know it's, it's just pure speculation. Yeah. And by the way, how many of you have ever invested in the dollar? That would be no one. There's no, you know, nobody is investing in the point being it's the most, it's the biggest form of currency there is, is the dollar. Yeah. If you wouldn't invest in the dollar, why would you buy some current, some coin that's floating out there somewhere? Yeah. Well, because people are hearing about it and they want to get rich quick. Um, but you know, the bulk of cryptocurrencies were, were are going to be worth zero. The ones that have yeah. already previous deals that got done, 2017, 2018, I, I, I agreed with Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett calls it rat poison. Uh, I just said 90% of cryptocurrencies will be worthless. And so many of those cryptocurrencies today are absolutely worthless. Yeah. Billions have been stolen. Hundreds of billions in, ve- in wealth has disappeared. Yeah. And so it's not the place to be putting your money. Especially we're talking about long term, right? Get rich in decades, not years. And I'll just say one more thing on this. What happened when you, when you talk to people, well, I just put a little bit in it. It's my play money. Okay, that's cool. But here's my question. Did you actually play to, to make the money? What do you mean? Like, did you go out and kick a ball outside? Were you playing? Is that how you made the money that you have to go invest it? <laughs> no, it's not. Right. You did this thing called work, W-O-R-K. Yeah. So you went out and worked to make money. Don't treat the money you worked for as if it's play money. Yes. You need to yes. treat your money you worked for as if it's work money. Yes. And when you think about your money like work money, you won't go play with it. If you can go play with it, then go down to Vegas and just stick it on red or, or yeah, you, you want to go you gotta go play kick a ball. Don't play with the money. Right? <laughs> go shoot some hoops. Don't play with the money. Yeah. Right? It's not it's not what you but, do. But you know, you go back to like how do you if, if you believe in cryptocurrency, then you're gonna invest in companies like Facebook or Amazon or Google. Because if anybody's gonna have the crypt they're gonna have their own currencies eventually, it's gonna be these big players. That's correct. And then they will have liquidity, they will build a trade and people will be actually using the cryptocurrency, right? Not holding right. on to it. Hopefully it will go up. It would appreciate. And even if you look at, if you go, I haven't read the whole paper yet that Facebook just put out the paper because yeah. it's going to yeah. be a separate organization. Yeah. They're not looking to have a currency go up in value. They're looking to have a stable platform to use it. That yeah. will be able to be used to do transactions. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what currency is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Currency is just a vehicle to trade, to, to move, to be able to buy something. Mm. For the most part, nobody's ever been, people don't, you don't hear, oh yeah, a genius way to go make money is to trade currencies. How many people do you know who become rich trading currencies? None. I don't know. I don't know anybody who's become, personally, who's become rich trading currencies. That's right. Uh, all, uh, every single person I know, either almost all through businesses, stocks, real estate. Yep. Super boring, super simple. Those are the things that work. Like, oh, you mean it's not that, that super duper investment no one's heard of? No, it's kind of these three things, right? Yep. Mostly, mostly, actually, all three together most of the time. Right? They make their money through the businesses. They put in real estate. They also have the portfolios in, in stocks. Right. That's pretty much it. Like, uh, like most, of the t- most of the time. And those are three great legs, right? Like if you're holding up a stool, those are the yeah. three great legs. So 100%. Up a stool. 100%. Hey, this has been really fun. I appreciate you, you wanting to do this show. Um, it's been great to hang out with you. Hey, David, uh, quickly, if our audience wants to get your book, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, come on. Thank you. Come on over to our website, thelattefactor.com. Thelattefactor.com. There's okay. a whole special website dedicated to the book. Nice. And also then come over to davidbach.com. Yeah, davidbach.com. Um, my big motivator would be come to lattefactor.com right now because we've got like $200 worth of bonus gifts when you buy the book. Nice. And you go through our process and our funnel. And then you can become a part of our community because we're, we're out there trying to build a group of people that want to build wealth and get free together. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. It's, it's been great having you on the show. Dan, thank you. It's really been fun. If I get out to Vancouver, um, I'll look you up. Yeah, definitely. Let me know. We'll hang okay. out. Thank Be you. Well, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank Take care. Bye-bye. All right.